So today I'm going to be talking about something that's a little further away from New Mexico. Um, our last couple lectures have looked primarily at the U.S. Army in the West and, and kind of discussed what was going on in New Mexico during the 19th century. And we, we've talked a bit before about uh, colonial period times uh, in New Mexico and the impacts of uh, Spanish soldiers, Spanish missionaries, and Spanish settlers on the indigenous peoples of New Mexico as a whole. And these next couple of lectures are going to take place outside of New Mexico. We're going to actually pull back and we're going to look at uh, the, the ethnogenesis and transformation of cultures as a whole worldwide. And for this talk, we will be specifically looking at the Taino of the Caribbean. Uh, coming up very shortly uh, is Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, formerly known as Columbus Day. And it's the Taino that had first contact with Columbus and, and perhaps suffered the most at the hands of the Spanish as, as a result of those early colonial ventures. Um, so we're going to be looking at um, these people and their legacy and primarily how they reacted to Spanish settlement and how the Spanish reacted uh, to their, their encounters with the Taino. And hopefully we'll end with a, a couple lasting legacy bits on how the Taino are still with us, especially in American culture, which I think is, is pretty profound. A lot of the things you do as an American, you might not think of them as Taino, but they are. Okay, so who are the Taino? These were the people of first contact with the Spanish in 1492. At the time of 1492, they occupied the Great An Greater Antilles, um, the northernmost islands of the Lesser Antilles, and, and the Bahamas. So they, they, most of the Caribbean islands uh, were home to these Taino peoples. And while they're traditionally looked at as a, a single ethnic group, um, there, there, there are some there's some debate about that. There certainly, they, they show that archeologically, we can see a lot of uh, a variability across regions with the Taino peoples. So with this goal, we're gonna talk about who the Taino are and what they're doing at the time of Spanish contact, how they, 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 they handle being contacted by the Spanish, how they, how they both accommodate and resist uh, colonization by the Spanish, and then their legacy today. The Taino are not, so even though we tend to think of the Caribbean, we tend to put that in the North American sphere of influence. It's really not. Well, at, the, at the time of Spanish colonization, the Caribbean islands, especially the, the Greater Antilles, had been colonized not by North American Native American peoples, but by South American Native American peoples. And there's some debate exactly where they come from in South America. Some put them in the Colombian highlands, some put them in, in the Amazon basin, and it really doesn't matter. It, it, they're definitely from South America. Exactly where in South America, we don't know. The first look at the Taino in, in Arawak speakers is along the Orinoco River. Uh, they appear there around 500 BC, and you can watch based upon ceramic evidence as they migrate through across the Orinoco up to the Atlantic Ocean and then out into the Caribbean. Um, these proto-Taino uh, have colonized the, the Lesser Antilles in Puerto Rico by at least AD 600. They have gotten all the way through Hispaniola by AD 1000. And by 1492, they've spread across Cuba or most of Cuba and the Bahamas. So they've reached, they're in the process of probably moving into Florida when the Spanish arrive in 1492. Had things not changed, they probably would have reached the North American continent and started to colonize there as well. This is the distribution in 1492 as you can see here. So um, they've, they've actually lost some of the Lesser Antilles at, at this point. Only the northernmost of the Lesser Antilles are, are actually Taino at this point. Um, but th their, their control, pretty much they're, they're, they're perched to jump into Florida uh, as the time goes. Um, they replace and, and probably in many ways interbreed with the peoples that were already there um, but as I said, whether they're, they're a whole or not, you can see maps like this that say this is the distribution of Taino. You can also see some, um, some more detailed maps that often uh, put a circle around Puerto Rico and Hispaniola and, and say that th that's classic uh, Taino, whereas 
Uh, Jamaica and Cuba in the Bahamas were a, a little less advanced uh, necessarily, but um, there could be a lot of things going on prior to 1492. Unfortunately, the Taino did not leave us written records. So we're left uh, with oral traditions to some extent. And in those cases, those oral traditions can be really hard to get at because unfortunately, Spanish colonization will not go well for the Taino. Um, the localized attributes um, of, of all these different groups that we call Taino is, is made, some people argue that the idea of Taino, Taino is not a culture, but rather it's a family of different cultural groups. What you're looking at is a language family, lots of people that speak a similar language, but that if you really pulled them apart at 1492, they would have been actually different cultures. Conversely, um, some people, you know, certainly the Taino themselves, looked at the Carib people, as, especially the island Carib, as, as being very different from them. However, when we, we, we put together the northern Lesser Antilles, which is supposed to be Taino, and the southern Lesser Antilles, which is supposed to be Carib, if you look at them archaeologically, they're almost indistinguishable from one another. And, 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 and several scholars have actually argued that the word Carib is really not a cultural group at all. Rather, it's a word Taino people are probably using, which they distinguish from themselves, as we're the good people, we're the people who don't eat other people, we're, we're gentle, we're nice, the people who are mean and, and, and live for violence, those are Caribs, they eat people. So there, there, there's, a, there's a debate whether we really should distinguish between the two groups. Um, more importantly, if, if, if we're going to go that route, then, then the Carib peoples that live in South America today, that are ethnologically Carib, could be in, in many ways very close uh, related to the Taino. In fact, they speak a similar language. Uh, so what is Taino culture? Well, um, in broad terms, the Taino are, at the time of 1492 are divided into a, a number of large chiefdoms, each ruled by a cacique. Um, Hispaniola, which is modern day um, Haiti and, and um, uh, Santo Domingo, had five large chiefdoms that kind of divided the island. So five states, as it were, almost. And Puerto Rico had, uh, had about 18. Even though Puerto Rico is a smaller island, it was really divided. Um, and, and, and some of that could be the fact that Taino had been there so long that they had had time to distinguish themselves into multiple states over and over and over again. Um, it, but both of these islands were the most archaeologically complex. Um, while we don't get a huge amount from the Spanish, we do have some great accounts of some of their mythology and, and, and things like that later in times. From the accounts of the Spanish, we can say with certainty that they were patriarchal, but matrilineal. So uh, very similar to Pueblo peoples in New Mexico in that way. So inheritance is through the mother's line. Uh, interestingly, amongst the Taino, men and women could take multiple spouses. And there was um, at least some level of gender equality, which was... Uh, uh, relatively surprising to the Spanish. But it, 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 it's not that uncommon amongst uh, Native American peoples as a whole. Uh, their primary cultigen, they were agriculturalists. They primarily uh, farmed uh, cassava, which they called yuca. In fact, if you go to Puerto Rico today and you, you order uh, yucca or yuca, um, what they're really giving you is cassava. And it's, it's kind of like a, it's a root vegetable. It's not that unsimilar to potatoes. Uh, where it's different from potatoes is if you don't treat cassava before you eat it, it has a lot of arsenic in it. And it's actually can be quite deadly. So you have to, it, it's one of those vegetables. You don't just plant in the ground, pull it out and eat it. It actually requires quite a bit of processing. Uh, they also planted corn, which they uh, brought in from, they, 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 that at least we, we think came from primarily Mesoamerica, cotton, beans, squash, peppers, pineapple, sweet potato, and tobacco. And these were supplemented with wild species such as palm, guava, and, and zamia. They also hunted. Uh, the, the Caribbean islands has no large terrestrial mammals. It does have an animal the size of a car, and that's what you see here in this picture. It probably doesn't look like it. But that's about the same size as a uh, bug, you know, the old, old little bugs you used to see from, I think they were Volkswagen bugs, and I'm not a car person, but um, that leatherback turtle that you see there is about the size of a car. So there are some big animals you can hunt and eat in the Caribbean. 
Uh, but most of them are aquatic or semi-aquatic animals. The only time the leatherback turtle actually comes to land is to lay its eggs, um, which, uh, interestingly enough, its eggs were an aphrodisiac amongst the Taino people. So, But they also ate a ton of birds. In fact, one of the things the, the Spanish um, explorers, upon reaching the Caribbean, really noticed is how many birds were in the sky. And as we'll look at with some of the rock art, birds feature prominently in Taino um, images, primarily because of their value, probably as both a food, food source and as a ceremonial animal. And then, of course, shellfish and fish um, were, were vitally important to, to them. The villages themselves, obviously, this is a reconstruction. This is not like an archaeological site that survived until present day. But if you look, their houses are, are, are large, uh, primarily circular, sometimes rectangular structures. Those would all house a specific um, woman's uh, lineage. Um, so a, a, a family line is tied through women. Multiple families all connected through those lines would, would live in one house with each person not having necessarily a bed, but living in a hammock, you know, having a hammock that was hung, that was your, your personal sleeping space. And as you can see here, we're going to see lots of pictures of ball courts because that's the thing that really fascinates me. You'll notice that these, these circular structures are kind of surrounded. And if you notice, there's some people playing in the, the um, kind of the left-hand side of the image, uh, that flat open space, the, the rectangular space you see there is a small ball court. So they have a small plaza, the ball courts in the center. And then of course, surrounding that would have been their villages and the ocean itself. Um, here, here's a picture of a much larger ball court. This is one at Caguana in Puerto Rico. Um, a lot of the pictures I'm going to use of Puerto Rico are my own pictures because I've gone to, I've tried to go to every Taino site or reconstructed village I could possibly go to. Um, the ball courts in the Taino region are known as Bate. Um, and, and they're, they're very likely an influence from Mesoamerica. So if you want to think, the Southwest has the most northernmost ball courts, right? You know, it's a, the, the northernmost is in um, just north of Flagstaff, Arizona, right? Or there's some debate about some others in the American Southwest. But the American Southwest as a whole has the northernmost ball courts. Uh, well, the eastern and southernmost ball courts are all in, in, in the Taino regions. They, they took these attributes from Mesoamerica. In, in the Taino version... Uh, teams of about 20 played with a rubber ball. And interestingly enough, it appears to have been used uh, in, in addition to entertaining people and perhaps having a ceremonial purpose. It was used to settle disputes amongst the various chiefdoms. And, and perhaps it's not surprising that the largest ball court a site that we know of in, in, in the Taino lands in the Caribbean is in Puerto Rico, where they have so many chiefdoms. They have about 18 chiefdoms. And up in the center of this island, you know, up in the highlands, kind of where all these chiefdoms kind of come together, not perfectly, obviously, there is a site with, with 30 of these ball courts in it. And it likely served as a ceremonial center for many of the, the chiefdoms. Uh, spirituality amongst the Taino, Taino, like many indigenous peoples of, of North and South America, they had a rich uh, spiritual tradition. It, amongst the Taino, it is, is primarily focused on the worship of deities or spirits via zemis, which are, which are these idols you see, these stone idols. Um, they, they don't have to always be stone. They can be clay. They can be a lot of different items. But these heads that are, are usually anthropomorphic, uh, they can, uh, they're usually human or humanoid and are associated with weather. So um, not surprisingly, these people who live in the Caribbean who have to deal with you know, they're farmers and they have to deal with a lot of hurricanes. The most powerful deities in their religion are weather-oriented deities. Um, uh, you know, conversely, you know, we can look at European societies, right? The Slavic peoples were, were very strong farmers, and we'll actually be talking about them in a, a couple lectures. Their principal deities were associated with weather, too. It's unsurprising. Most agricultural societies find... Um, focus in on weather deities. Um, and these could be actually tacked on top of the house in some cases, though they've been found in a lot of different contexts archaeologically. So I don't know if I, I put uh, so much emphasis on that, but we, we do know that some were made of more perishable materials that we don't necessarily see today. Um, they also had a very large rock art tradition. Um, 
So those stones you saw at Caguana kind of lining the side of the ball court, uh, this is one of them. Um, so you can actually, they have uh, a lot of um, images of, of animals on these rocks as well as some of the, um, the Taino pantheon, as it were, of, of, of important figures. Um, they have a robust tradition of fabricating rock art, just like the peoples of the American Southwest. And these were probably made for a variety of purposes. In this case, it's decorating the side of a ball court, probably in, in, in some sort of uh, ritualistic purpose. But we also see these, these things um, on the borders of, of multiple chiefdoms. Uh, one of the stranger things we see in Taino rock art, which I'm not as aware of happening in most other societies. Now, mind you, I work in the American Southwest for the most part, not in, in, in areas that are very close to the ocean. Um, but we, we see with the Taino an emphasis on placing rock art in places that are only accessible or viewable during particularly low tides. So a lot of times they'll, they'll do rock art in, in, in these areas that you will only get to see if the tides are way down. These are not things that you would know were there, uh, which makes them strange as boundary markers. Unless you came at a certain time of day and that time's going to change, right, based on the lunar cycle. That, that would be the only time you'd ever see that rock art. Um, so that, that kind of um, argues against some of these being boundary markers uh, necessarily. But they're, they're also put, I, I love it because in many cases, these things are put um, uh, near uh, the ones that are only visible, you know, under particularly low tides. I, I had the, um, and I'm not saying this is true, but I, I've always had this idea that, you know, you know, they have all those signs for the, the big, um, tidal waves. And I, I, I've never been through a, a tidal wave myself or a tsunami. Um, however, I know that the tides go way out right before the, the wave comes in, right? Like the, the, the ocean's supposed to like go peel way back. They engaged in war and engaged in peace, of course. Um, their principal enemies were the Carib, which if you read that as a different people, then their enemies were the people of the, they, they, they fought with people of the Lesser Antilles. If you take the broader view that Carib were just any warlike Taino, the, the Taino's principal enemies were other Taino. And the, the, according to the Taino, the bad ones are the ones that ate each other. The good ones are the ones who didn't eat each other. Um, but warfare prior to the Spanish arrival was typically very small scale with raid, raiding parties on canoes uh, armed with bows and makana. In this case, these are not the maca weedles of Mesoamerica. They're, they're, um, kind of a paddle-shaped club, as it were, so you could row the canoe with it and you could hit somebody with it. Kind of has the shape of a sword, but it's not a, it's not a weapon that's necessarily going to inflict... I mean, it can inflict horrible damage, don't get me wrong, but it, it's not on the same scale of inflicting horrible wounds that you might see amongst uh, Mesoamerican peoples. Um, also, when we look at their, their archival record, at their belief system, it, it's remarkable at how peaceful their spirituality is. Um, one of the things we see a lot in, in many um, polytheistic religions often, and I, and I don't mean this just Native American religions, I mean polytheistic as in uh, Nordic gods, Greek gods, it, take any polytheistic society, society where you have multiple gods, multiple spirits all vying for control. We tend to see in those narratives a lot of violence amongst the gods. We really don't see that as much. You know, when you read the, the tales of the Taino people as, as written by a later priest, obviously, um, they're, they're remarkably peaceful. The, the resolutions are relatively peaceful. Moreover, we, we, we see, for, for, and this is a densely populated area, we see um, the ball carts are often used to settle disputes, suggesting that not only is there not a lot of ritual violence in their mythology, but there may not have been a whole lot of actual physical violence in that they're onto you. No, they're human beings. Everybody's a human being. Human beings hurt each other. That's nothing new. But in, in this case, it, it, it's kind of interesting in how peaceful, or at least how we perceive them as being peaceful relative to other peoples. Oh, so European arrival. That's a lot on the Taino and kind of who they were and what they were doing. For the second half of this talk, I really want to talk about what happens when the Spanish arrive. When did the Spanish arrive? Well, they arrived on the day we used to call Columbus Day, right? October 12, 1492. Um, when Columbus uh, encounters the, the Americas, uh, based upon his charts, which were uh, from the Middle Ages, they were not 
uh, modernized charts of the modern world. They were they were charts based upon Marco Polo's journeys. He thought he had encountered a the outer islands of Chipangu. Um, Marco Polo's Chipangu and what what um, Columbus believed he had discovered was Japan. Um, however, what Columbus had really discovered was the the Caribbean and, and ultimately the the islands that he thought were Japan were the Greater Antilles. Um, first contact is actually made in the Bahamas. The, the first landfall by European peoples was in the Bahamas at a, 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 an island known as Guahani. I'm probably, Guanahani, I'm probably not saying that right now. I apologize. Um, the, you know, Europeans uh, pulled off off the coast and a group of young Taino men stood out on the shore to greet them. Uh, during this exchange, um, the Tainos offered cotton and shell in exchange for broken pottery and glass beads. And yes, that's right, broken pottery. The Spanish also inquired as the Taino had um, some gold rings, mostly nose rings and things of that nature, little decorative pieces on them. And of course, the Spanish, the first thing they ask is not, um, but where did you get that? I want that. And they said, well, you know, the, these things are more plentiful to the south. Um, and so the Spanish drop everything and start to head south, right? They, they don't stay for very long in the Bahamas. Interestingly enough, we actually know what Columbus was thinking at the time based upon his journals. Um, and his thoughts upon this first day of meeting the Taino people. Remember the first day, this isn't I've met these people. What do I think of them? And this is what he writes. And I, I think this is very telling of future relationships between Europeans and indigenous peoples. They're fairly tall on the whole, with fine limbs and good proportions. I saw some who had wound scars on their bodies. And I asked them by science how they got these. And they indicated to me that the people came from other islands near who tried to capture them. And they defended themselves. I supposed, and still suppose, that they came from the mainland to capture them for slaves. They should be good servants and very intelligent, for I have observed that they would soon repeat anything that is said to them. And I believe that they would be easily made Christians, for they appear to me to have no religion. God willing, when I make my departure, I will bring half a dozen of them back to their majesties so they can learn to speak. What he is saying upon his first encounter with these people is that they would make good slaves and he's already decided he's going to take a couple of them back as slaves, uh, which he does. And by the time he ends his journey, his first trip to the, the New World, he actually takes back seven Taino. Uh, five die, and the remainder serve as interpreters on a second voyage. But he continues south for now. One of uh, Columbus's ships wreck in, in, on December 25th, 1495, the La Navidad. Um, out of the wreckage, the, the, the Columbus and his party... Uh, form the, the small settlement of Santa Maria on the coast of Hispaniola. We don't exactly know what happens to the settlement, uh, but when he returns, when Columbus returns on his second voyage, remember he takes some slaves and he boogies off back to Europe. In fact, he, he doesn't even go to Spain right away. He actually goes to Portugal uh, to, to brag that he was right all along and they should have funded his expeditions and the Portuguese kind of blow him off and he ends up going back to Spain. And he, he says the same thing. He says, I was right. I discovered Asia. I've seen the Japanese people here. I even brought some with me. Um, and, um, you know, the Portuguese are like, I, I don't think those are Japanese people. But the Spanish hear them out. And they're like, oh, maybe they're Japanese. Uh, but you need to go back there. And so he does go back there. He goes back there to find that his, his settlement's destroyed in, in 1493. So his soldiers ask around. Uh, one of the men on this expedition is a doctor. Uh, a Castilian doctor by the name of Diego Alvarez Chanca. And they're going around questioning the Taino in the area, like, what happened? They can see the wreckage of the settlement. And, and this is what he writes in his, his, own, um, his own account. That day we again visited the place the village had been and found many Indians there that had gained confidence and were bartering gold. So this is like the second day. They visit the ruins. They come back the next day and there's Taino there looking to trade. Um, they bartered almost a mark's worth. We learned that they had pointed out where 11 Christians lay covered in the grass that had grown over them. So they find the, the bodies of their comrades. They all told us 
through an interpreter that one of those slaves that Columbus had taken back, uh, that Canobo and Mareni, rival Taino caciques, had killed them. So their rivals had killed them. But then they started to complain. They complained that, you know, each of these dudes that was living in this village was taking three or four women uh, for themselves. And so Diego says, you know, he says, from which we concluded that they may have been murdered out of jealousy. So even though they're pointing to these guys over here, these guys that live further down into the island, we, we got a good idea that they're, um, they, they may have killed them themselves. Columbus arrives the next day and, and, and meets with the local cacique. He wants to know what happened. He also wants to collect tribute, right? So he, he gets off his boat and he, he, he makes a big huff and goes into the Taino village where he meets a cacique by the name of uh, Guacarm. I'm, I'm sorry, Guacam Kamari. I'm probably butchering that one as well, who tells him a, a similar story. Moreover, he points to an injury on his leg, uh, which Chacon thinks is completely fake. He's like, that's, there's no way that's happened. But he claimed to receive it while, while fighting to protect the Spanish. And Columbus is like, not sure what to do. But Columbus goes back to his boat, right? You know, because he primarily went to get tribute, uh, not necessarily to find out what happened to his dead men. He goes back to his boat. And um, several nights later, because of course, these Spaniards are also collecting Taino women, right? You know, because they're lonely. And, and in the middle of the night, these women, along with uh, Guacamari and his group, all flee into the night. So the Spanish wake up one morning and those Taino that, that said they were there defending the Spanish all flee. Columbus is not deterred. He decides to establish a new settlement. In fact, this is a representative drawing of that settlement, La Isabella uh, on Hispaniola. He, he founds this settlement in December of 1493. And then shortly thereafter, he decides, you know, this settlement's good, but what I really need is something closer to where the gold is. And so he establishes Fort Santo Tomas in 1494, and he can begin to start to tax the Taino in earnest. So he's, he's, he's gathering tribute from these folks. Um, and when I mean tribute, it, we're going to talk about what that actually is in a little bit, but mostly gold and cotton. Canobo, the, the guy that Guacamari had said did the, the de bad deed, uh, leads the Taino in a rebellion while most of Columbus and his guys are off exploring Cuba and Jamaica. And Columbus returns to the island to find Guacamari, the guy who had fled from him and had told him he you know, received a wound and, and lied about those things. Guacamari comes out of hiding when Columbus returns and says, look, we need to get rid of Canobo. And Columbus decides that that's the best thing. He's not sure who is necessarily responsible for the death of, of his, his earlier settlement, but he's, he's willing to side with Guacamari. Um, and, and with Guacamari's aid, um, Columbus has an army of 100,000 potentially Taino at his disposal, as well as 200 Spaniards, 20 horses, and 20 war dogs. Remember, this is, in, this is in 1495, so we're still talking about the first three years of contact here. And they decisively beat Canobo. We have an account of the battle from one of Columbus's brothers, uh, Ferdinand. Um, I think it's, I, it might be his nephew or it, it's, it's one of his, his um, brothers. And I forget which Ferdinand is off the top. Um, it, it's important to probably note that amongst the Genoese, um, there were a lot of Columbuses in the, in the Caribbean during this time. We tend to think it's Christopher and we say Columbus and Columbus and Columbus. Well, there was a lot of his family members taking part in these activities. Um, but Columbus, who is the admiral, Christopher Columbus, uh, is, is the admiral. He says, knowing the nature and habits of these Indians, the admiral, Columbus, uh, divided his army with his brother, the Aldentado, uh, two days after he left Isabella. So I guess this is definitely his nephew, because Bartholomew would be his, or, or Bartholomew would be his um, brother two days after they left Isabella. His intention was to make an attack from two different directions on the Indians who were scattered about in the fields, for he thought that fear on hearing the sound of firing from various sides would make them light, more likely than anything else to put to flight. And as was eventually demonstrated by the events, when the infantry squadrons of both armies had attacked the mass of Indians 
and they had begun to break under the fire of muskets and crossbows. The cavalry and hunting dogs charged wildly upon them to prevent them from reforming. The Indians fled like cowards in all directions, and our men pursued them, killing so many and wrecking such havoc among them to be brief. By God's will, uh, victory was achieved, many Indians being killed and many others captured and executed. Kenobo, the, the principal king of them all, was taken alive with his sons and his women. Kenobo is, of course, tortured, right? And so he confesses, uh, well, uh, you know, being tortured to death, he confesses to attacking La Navidad. Um, most sources think that he probably did attack La Navidad, but Guacamari, who, who um, the, the doctor had thought, sus suspected, had actually done the attack, eventually falls out of favor amongst the um, Columbus and the, the, the Europeans, and he actually ends up living out the last of his days, dying, um, uh, uh, died up in the mountains, broken and destitute. That actually comes from Las Casas, uh, that account of what happened to his life. And Columbus's brother, uh, the, the, the brother who had helped um, the admiral lead the attack, uh, is going to found Santo Domingo uh, on, on Hispaniola. Um, at this point, it would be nice to say that, the, the, or, or easy to say that Spanish colonization then quickly spread to the other islands, but it didn't. It actually turned for, for matters for worse amongst the two factions of Europeans on the island. One was Columbus's faction, which was largely Genoese, and one was um, Castilian or Spanish. Um, and, and the Castilians ultimately won the, the, the fight for who was in charge uh, of Hispaniola. During this time, they also put a huge tax on all Taino males over the age of 14. Uh, those who live near the gold fields need to pay in gold. Elsewhere, they can pay in cotton. And all the colonists, whether Genoese or, or, or Castilian, are granted encomiendas, large land allotments. And, and, and as the natives are dying from disease um, and, and, of course, this warfare that had been going on, uh, they start to import African American slave labor, or African slave labor. I shouldn't say African American. They were African Americans after they got to the Americas, and and of course Taino from other islands. So they're they're using both indigenous peoples. And here we have the ethnogenesis of the modern day Caribbean peoples, as both these Taino, these native peoples, and Africans fled from the Spanish who treated them hostile. They kind of formed their own like little maroon settlements. These little settlements, these enclaves in the mountains. And um, in both these, these little enclaves where they hid out from the Spanish and on the plantations, both groups started to intermarry quite frequently, which is the basis of all Afro-Caribbean cultures we have today. On Hispaniola, on the island of Columbus, this union gave birth to voodoo, uh, which is what we can see these young men practicing here. After the infighting amongst the, the Castilians and Genoese uh, over who controlled the Caribbean, expansion, once that was decided and, and debated, expansion happened very rapidly. Uh, Puerto Rico was colonized by Ponce de Leon in 1508. Uh, Jamaica was taken in 1509. And then Cuba by Diego Vasquez in, in 1511. Now, obviously, I can't talk at length about all of these different uh, colonization movements, but I, I did want to offer a quote here from Las Casas about how these conquests were gone. And this is what he has to say about Puerto Rico and Jamaica. He says, in 1509, the Spanish, with the same purpose in mind as they had had when they landed on Hispaniola, found their way to the two verdant islands of Puerto Rico and Jamaica. Both of them lands flowing with milk and honey. Here they perpetrated the same outrages and committed the same crimes as before, devising yet further refinements of cruelty, murdering the native people, burning and roasting them alive, throwing them to wild dogs, and then impressing, tormenting, and plaguing them with toil down the mines and elsewhere so that once again killing of these poor innocents to such an effect that where the native population of two islands was certainly over 600,000 Fewer than 200 survive on each of these two islands, all the others having perished without ever learning the truths of the Christian religion and without the benefits of the sacrament. Now, obviously, um, Las Casas is, is, is overblowing things uh, to some degree, but his numbers, even if they are not accurate per se, I think you can go from 600,000 to um, uh, 400, because uh, there's 200 on each island, 
that that's a big population decline. That's a 99.99% decline, right? That's a, that's a big one. Um, and, and, and Casas knew what he was talking about to some extent. He was actually there to witness this firsthand. He was actually the chaplain, serving as the chaplain, uh, when they laid waste to Cuba. Uh, he was there. You know, it wasn't just Diego uh, Velasquez who was there. He was there with Hernan Cortez. He was there with Pedro de Alvarado, Penfilio de Navares. They were all there, Cuba. This represents the blueprint print for what's going to come to the Americas. Uh, the Taino, even though their populations were, were largely gone uh, by 1510, uh, they continued to perform some resistance. Uh, the most famous and long-lasting of these uprisings uh, was the, the, um, the Spanish and Taino War of, 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 Ber of San Juan, or Puerto Rico, Bernakin, that's the um, Taino word for uh, Puerto Rico. Um, the initial phase of the first uh, about a decade, the Taino went into an open conflict with the Spanish, but then once they lost that, they retreated into the Lesser Antilles, and then they, they performed uh, raids on the island. So they would come back, grab some of their brothers, you know, destroy a farm or two, and then leave again. Interestingly enough, at this point, they look exactly like the Caribs. And in fact, mention of the Taino just kind of dissipates. By the end of the 1540s, so by the time New Mexico is, is on the radar for the Spanish, there are only several hundred Tainos living a traditional way of life. Um, those that do not die of um, disease or warfare are gradually acculturated into African and European colonial cultures. Uh, here we can see the Spanish chopping off the hands of many Taino peoples um, in, in the islands. However, they're still with us. While Taino culture was, was um, from an archaeological and from an archival perspective, extinct by the 17th century, by the 1600s, there, are, there is no Taino villages. There are no people speaking Taino. Um, 21st century geneticists have demonstrated um, that all the diverse peoples, the peoples of Jamaica that are almost, they, they, you know, that look very, very much um, African, in their things versus the people who live in Puerto Rico. If you look at all the genetics of all these different people, they all share Taino bloodlines and, and, and Taino genetics. So the Taino people are still with us. They're just a many different peoples today. Uh, moreover, when, when you start to think about it, many of these aspects, these, these traits of the Taino are still with us today. And, and, and in some cases, they're, they're, they're so part of the fabric of our, our, our colonial heritages that you don't think about where they come from. And so I want to give you a couple examples before I open up to questions. Uh, the first one's cooking. If you'll notice here, here's a, a, you know, it's obviously a European picture. These look very uh, European, uh, European kind of anglified uh, indigenous peoples. But if you'll notice here, they've got like a, a blanket spread or hide spread on the ground. Then they, they got like something boiling in the pot. But then in the back, you'll notice they got all those fish on a little uh, grill there. Um, so barbecue. Barbecue is a, is a Taino word. Um, the Taino traditionally cooked or marinated meats on a framework of sticks, which they called barbecue or barbacoa. They also, as, as part of this practice, often ate corn off the cob because their climate was inhospitable to preserving corn as flour. So corn on the cob and, and, and grilled meat, um, those things actually arrive in North America, not from indigenous peoples, not from Europe, but as a result of the triangle trade, the, um, the idea that it, 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 you know, the, these attributes, which have been going strong is that the Spanish developed their sugar plantations in, 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 in the English developed their sugar plantations and ultimately rum, right? You know, the, the, the manufacture of rum. These traditions uh, which link uh, the New England and Eastern American colonies with the Caribbean and with England, of, of those things that comes in through there is barbecue. Barbecue is something that is, was not practiced uh, by, the, by the indigenous peoples of, of North America. It's a, it's a Taino trait that we think of today is, is primarily, it's, you know, 4th of July is about barbecue. Um, it, it's interesting to think that, that that cultural trait, that means of cooking and, and way of eating really does come from the Taino. 
Uh, another one is sleeping. You know, we talked about hammocks. Um, the Taino um, were by no means the only people that, that, that um, slept in suspended interwoven cloth structures, you know, hammocks. Uh, but the word hammock is Taino. Uh, in fact, European navies developed these, these sleeping arrangements on boats from the Taino. So the, like, like barbecue, these practices of sleeping like this were adopted from, uh, from indigenous peoples, from the Taino specifically, and brought into the navies. But, but perhaps the mo lo most local example I can give you of how the Taino have touched everyone is the word cacique. Um, the Spanish who, who met the Taino first came to know the word cacique. It's not a Spanish word. It's a word that the Taino people used for a chief. A chief. Um, and the Spanish adopted this term so that whenever they dealt with new Native American groups, right, the, the first thing they asked is, we want to talk to your cacique. Well, most of these groups didn't have a cacique. They didn't know what one was. But this term and this idea of a, a headman was actually pushed onto other people. So here we have uh, the cacique from Isleta del Sur down in El Paso here in this image. But today, if we were to look at the indigenous tribes of New Mexico, right, they all have caciques. That role may or may not have existed. It certainly wasn't called a cacique prior to the arrival of the Spanish. And the role, the, the expectations the Spanish had for that role were largely defined by how the Taino organized themselves. So what can we have as some conclusions to talk about the Taino and, 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 and put it in, uh, into discussion on this, this Columbus Day kind of discussion of um, European contact in the Caribbean? Uh, well, the Taino migrated from the, or in the Orinoco River Basin. Uh, from there, they developed their distinct culture in, in the Caribbean. Um, it was focused primarily on the acquisition of maritime resources and the cultivation of cassava. They were strong and the most popular peoples in, you know, uh, most populous peoples in the Caribbean in 1492, and they were the first people encountered by Europeans. Um, those encounters led to a sharp decline in Taino populations. Um, they resisted. Like all indigenous peoples, when we start to look deeper into the narrative, they resisted. Um, however, uh, while their, their, their culture was viewed by historians and by archaeologists as largely extinct uh, by the 17th century, we can see both in their genetic makeup, the, the peoples who live in the Caribbean today are all indigenous, they all share the heritage of these indigenous peoples. Uh, moreover, their cultural traits surround us to the point where we don't even notice that they are Taino cultural traits that we've adopted. So with that, I will open it up. Here's me standing in front of some of the, the spiritual figures at Caguana, or I'm sitting down on the ground, actually. And I will be happy to answer all of your questions, or the best I can. One of the words that we use regularly that's a Taino word is cannibales, cannibals. And you were I, just I didn't talking know about that, that one, earlier. but that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> yeah, I read that somewhere not too long ago. I, um, in looking at the rock art, it looks as if it's almost painted on those rocks rather than the, the, um, it's, really it's pecked, art. I assure you. It's paint. It's, it's pecked, pecked, chipped. Pecked. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, the color is, in, in most of those images I showed you, it's the underlying rock. So what you're looking at is the aged surface versus the pecked surface. But I think at Caguana, they've cleaned a lot of those things up. I can't speak for the state park in Puerto Rico that handles mm -hmm. those things today. Uh, what levels of cleaning up they've done to make those more noticeable. Um, a, a lot of times, though, they're not nearly that distinct. Um, but, but they can be. Um, they have a lot of... Because... Um, the area is, is um, uh, the, the rock art's all over the place. And, and, and their, their rock, is it's a hard rock. They have basalts and, and volcanic rocks, which really preserve uh, the petroglyphs really well, just like you, you see outside of Albuquerque today. Um, uh, but there are some questions in the chat. First of all, BB says, where can I get some of those leatherback turtle eggs? I have a horror story for you guys on, on, on leatherback turtle eggs. Um, 
So I took my kids. So I normally go out to the west side of the islands and I never even seen, I mean, I knew I'd seen pictures of leatherback turtles, right? And I'd seen the things don't disturb their nests. Um, one day I was walking down, uh, I, was, I was in Lukio, I think, and I was on the eastern side of the island near the, the, the wildlife sanctuary. And um, I'm walking on the wildlife sanctuary and I'm, I'm walking. And I just remember there was a whole bunch of seagulls down by the water. I walked right by it and the seagulls were going crazy, but we didn't get too close to them because I figured stupid birds want to be crazy. Let them be crazy over there. You know, the kids don't, the kids were still young at this point. I'm like, yeah, I don't need to be near them. But as I'm walking back, there's a whole bunch of people clustered around the area those seagulls were taking an interest in. And they wave us over and they say, hey, do you want to see baby leatherback turtles? And, and because they were digging out the nest. Um, what had happened uh, that they told us, and we got to hold some of the sea turtles, which is very sweet. They're all, they, when, they're, when they, they get to this, be the size of cars, but they're really little. They're only like the size, you know, like that. When you hold them at first and they're very beautiful. Um, so what the, the seagulls have been doing is eating all the babies as they tried to go down into the water. That's what they've been eating. That's what was driving them crazy. And you get to see all the broken shells. But no, you cannot disturb the nest today. That's not why I asked about the eggs. Oh, no, I, I can imagine. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, uh, Never mind. Okay. So there were some questions about cassava. Um, um, yes, there are a lot of, I you know several people are adding more Taino words that we have, such as hurricane, iguana, maize, papaya. Those are all Taino words. Um, yes, cassava is actually indigenous to South America. It actually moves to Africa later on in, in the uh, Colombian exchange. Uh, to make cassava edible, I'm not an expert on it, but my understanding is you kind of, you grate it up and then you soak it and then you press it and then you soak it, and then you press it, and, and somehow the water drains out a lot of the arsenic. And eventually it becomes something you can eat without making yourself sick. But it's pretty complicated. And in fact, Arawak people, so I, I said at the very beginning that the Taino people speak an Arawak language. Arawak peoples today, I was actually blown away. I was, I, I, you know, as many of you know, I love hunting. Um, I was watching a, a meat eater episode where he was down fishing in, in one of the uh, rivers of, of, of South America and the tribe he was working with were Arawak. And uh, even though they're not Taino, right, they, they don't live in the islands at all, they were still doing the cassava and they were still grilling all the fish on barbecues through the traditional fashion and you could actually watch it. I was watching a hunting special, right, about an Anglo guy that goes over there and wants to catch fish but then decides to learn how the natives handle it. And what I realized is that halfway through, even though this wasn't booked, you know, it wasn't promoted as an anthropological thing, I started thinking to myself, like later on, I'm actually getting more anthropologically out of watching these folks than I am out of the hunting aspect of catching the fish. Um, but it's, it's rather fascinating. Cassava is, is, or yucca, as it's known in the Caribbean, is, is a pretty harsh, it's a very good starch i think it has quite a few calories it's actually really good for you you can eat a lot of it and it'll it's it's like a potato right potatoes are not good for you let's not let's not do anything but they have lots of calories and you they can be grown just about everywhere um why would you why would the um taino people get the ball court and not get the story and the purpose of the ball court that seems odd to me you know, I don't, I don't know why that aspect of Mesoamerican culture was adopted and why other aspects were not. Um, there's also a level of how much interaction they had with Mesoamerica, like how much contact were they having, um, especially since these are, are very, in, in their cultural terms, they're very South American people. A lot of the things they do in, in their mythology, for example, has nothing to do with Mesoamerica. It doesn't follow along those same lines. It doesn't their, their social structures appear quite a bit different. They're not, um, and, and linguistically, they're just completely off base. Uh, in fact, um, somebody recently sent me in, uh, an article uh, looking at um, Mayans being imported into um, uh, the, the Caribbean to work plantations. And I'm going to forget who it was, but I'm sure they're on this lecture now. So I am sorry, I'm forgetting who sent it to me. But uh, the, the, the beauty of it is, so Native Americans in, in North America have, I, I think, two blood types, and I might be mistaken slightly, but there's, there's genetics in North American peoples that aren't in South American indigenous peoples. 
Um, and when they checked, you know, peoples in the Caribbean today, they realized they both had North and uh, South American indigenous blood in them. Well, the South American indigenous blood was, was likely the Taino, um, but it, it goes to show that some of those interactions had happened. And, and I, I thought it was funny because the article was a good thing. And like, how does that ha interaction happen? But it doesn't appear to be happening prehistorically. Well, it's probably happening historically with slaves being imported into the Caribbean uh, from mainland Mexico. It probably has little to do with that. We don't see a lot of direct cultural exchange between those groups, but they did know each other existed. So for example, when they conquer Cuba, the Taino peoples in Cuba knew damn well that there was likely a, a, a large, um, there were large civilizations on mainland America. So when the Spanish go off in, in search of the Aztec, when, when Alvarado ends up uh, going out, for example, or, or later Cortez with Alvarado, they know damn well that the, these civilizations exist, that there are these bigger population centers than even the Taino have. Uh, what's, what's probably amazing, though, to us is just how densely populated the Caribbean islands were. You know, we, we go out to the Caribbean, maybe not so much Puerto Rico, which is pretty heavily populated, but if you go to like the lesser Antilles today, right, you go to any of them, um, the, 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 or the Bahamas, the, the, the driving the allure, right, is, it is these beautiful beaches with very few people on them. Um, that may not have been the case prehistorically. Maybe these islands may have had large populations um, of these indigenous peoples. And we're not sure exactly how large. We, we, we suspect, obviously, that, that Columbus's accounts um, and Las Casas' accounts are, are overly exaggerated in many ways. And Columbus's accounts, obviously, he's just making up stuff. Um, uh, about how he's found Japan. Um, the, um, we do think there were large populations there. Exactly, the exact numbers may not matter so much as there were a lot of people there and a lot of people died. Matt, um, to go back to the ball courts, the ones that you saw in, in Cuba and uh, Hispanola and all of that, um, were they shaped the same way? Because the, the shape of the ball court is critical to the to the story of you know the opening of the back of the no, turtle and that sort. Of thing. No, the Taino ball courts are just square rectangle or rectangular, very clear rectangles. There's some variations in shape, but not very much. Uh, they're also uh, highly variable, and, and this is true, I guess, in Mesoamerican ball courts. They're highly variable in size. We're not even sure they're exactly playing the same game. So th this is in some ways influenced by Mesoamerica, but it's certainly something that got to the islands and took its own shape. Uh, the, the key though is, is it's a rubber ball. Um, the question that somebody put in, in chat was, what kind of ball did they use? It was a rubber ball, probably very similar to what they used in Mesoamerica, but exactly how they played the game uh, is very different. And certainly the practices in Mesoamerica associated with those ball courts don't appear to be going on in, in, in these, these villages. At least we, we, would ex we would suspect that the Spanish would have mentioned it if they had seen something like that, and they don't. Um, th the most interesting thing, I think, uh, as far as Taino religious aspects go, and I don't have the account in front of me, but there's an account of a, a Spanish priest, I think it was on Columbus's second voyage, who tried to write everything down he could about the um, Taino religion. I think there's a passage in there that even prior to any African um, kind of influence whatsoever, the passage to me reads like he's talking about zombies. And I always found that interesting because we tend to look at voodoo as being something that's primarily brought over from Africa. And, and, and we know it was a mixture of Taino and, and African cultures, but I was amazed at how clear you know, given our, our, our current day American fascination with all things zombie, which I know voodoo zombies are quite a bit different from the walking dead kind of zombies. It was amazing to me at how close those stories within a few years of Spanish contact before any African slaves have really made it to the islands whatsoever. You can see um, the, the, the origins of voodoo uh, religion, which I thought was kind of interesting. And none of the names necessarily, but it was, it was fascinating. I have a question. Um, Matt, uh, do you have a, any idea of um, the, the percentage of DNA that, that uh, 
of, of the Taino or native people the, there that exist today, like I, in Cuba or Puerto Rico? I think it's, I, I would bet it's highly variable. Um, as you would to drive around to any of these islands today, the, 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 the look of Caribbean peoples is, is highly variable from island to island, but also across the island, you know, driving, there are sections of Puerto Rico where people look very uh, European versus there's areas where people look very much um, mixed with African blood, for example. Um, the, I would assume that the genetic legacy is different amongst every person. But I think every person there, I mean, the, the reality is whether they have any European or African blood in them, um, you know, it, it's up to indigenous tribes as to how much they recognize as being um, a thing. And I know there is a, um, a, a, an argument right now that everybody in Puerto Rico should identify as Native American as opposed to uh, based upon those studies. I'm not a geneticist, nor do I have a, a political want to, to prove to you about whether they are indigenous or not. Obviously, um, a part of a part of indigenous culture, obviously, is it more than just genetics. It's actually maintaining that culture. Uh, the interesting thing is we all maintain Taino culture when we grill up for the 4th of July mm -hmm. or we go to Rudy's Barbecue in Albuquerque. We are technically, um, wh whether it's Texas barbecue or not, which is, um, and in fact, when I was doing a Google uh, thing on um, this lecture, I found that there is a Taino smokehouse in like Columbus, Ohio, yeah. that supposedly serves authentic Taino foods or th barbecue, right? So I clicked on it. I was like, oh my God, I got to see what they're serving. And it was like chicken and pork and beef and like any <laughs> other regular barbecue you get at Rudy's. Uh, no, no offense to them. It's, it's probably pretty good, but I just found it amazing that somebody had clicked onto that. Hey, the Taino or the people who did barbecue originally, we're going to use that name. Um, Matt, Matt, this is this is Cheryl. Um, I'm, I am, I'm destroyed at this story, of the just gross Spanish, you know, disregard for life, and the, and and the brutality. I thought it was bad here. I assume that there are no statues to Columbus in the Lesser Antilles. If you were in Spain, do they, how did they handle this period of Spanish brutality and decimation in teaching the story to their children? Uh, well, I, I can't speak for Spain. Um, I can speak for Puerto Rico. Um, um, Puerto Rico has, has a mixed relationship, obviously. There are people in Puerto Rico that want to embrace their indigenous roots, and there are people that, that firmly cling to a Spanish ideology. Uh, for example, Ponce de Leon, who obviously conquered Puerto Rico, the second largest city in Puerto Rico, at, you know, first is obviously San Juan, but on the opposite side of the island is Ponce. Um, and I'm pretty sure, and I, I could be wrong, I don't know if... It's not where I normally go in Puerto Rico. Uh, Ponce is not like my go-to destination by any stretch of the imagination. But I'm pretty sure they have, a, they have a statue of Ponce de Leon in the center of town. Um, certainly some of the other towns certainly have statues of, of, of Spanish conquistadors of one form or another, whether they're local heroes. Um, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, many places in the Caribbean also um, identify with pirates and have, have chosen to uh, support pirate, you know, to, to take pirates and, and turn them into local icons and legends, uh, which is certainly an age, the age of piracy would come after this and is not really relevant to the discussion I've had today. I, I think there are a variety of um, different takes, but I, I've always been very proud uh, of, you know, the territory of Puerto Rico in embracing, I mean, Caguana, those pictures I gave you, the pictures I primarily used for the petroglyphs, both of my opening slide of the, the ball courts, the various petroglyphs, almost all of those came from Caguana, uh, which is a state park uh, that is operating. It's pretty much Puerto Rico's New Mexico historic sites. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a local, so the National Park Service operates the, the large Spanish fortresses in San Juan, you know, and preserves that, that Spanish culture the local people, the local government, 
has, has chosen to, to promote and protect um, this indigenous heritage site, which I'm, I'm very proud of the Puerto Rican people for doing. Um, I would bet that it's, it's variable across the islands as to how the narrative plays out. Uh, but I think their legacy amongst us is irrefutable. Uh, the documentation of what occurred to them is irrefutable. Um, the, the, if, if these things seem shocking to you, uh, what should primarily seem shocking to you is that Columbus is literally, the day he met these people, already determining their fate as slaves. That Columbus, the admiral, before Cortez, Cortez is remembered as a great general. Before Pizarro, he's remembered as a great general. We see the blueprint for the conquest of all the Americas in Columbus originally putting down that revolt in Hispaniola. The pincer maneuver, the using, use of cavalry, the use of dogs, the, the playing of, of one cacique, one uh, chief against another chief to bolster his forces. All of those things are happening at the very, very start of, of European colonization. And it's, I should be clear, I say, we say Spanish, but we need to be clear that we're, we're really talking European. Uh, Columbus is technically Genoese. Some of the people with him are Castilian, but this is a, a um, to, to just put it on the Spanish is unfair on the Spanish. This is something that would be taken by all European peoples when treating, when dealing with indigenous peoples. But this entire blueprint, the, the surprising thing, the really shocking thing is that it's all set within a year or two. Literally contacts me and, it's, and, and, and we're already going down that road. It's, it's not a matter of these things happened later when they saw the Aztecs and they saw how much gold Mesoamerica had and then they became gold crazy. The first thing out of their mouths is, hey, that's a nice piece of gold in your nose. Where did that come from? You know what? You... You seem like you'd make a good slave. You know, um, th these people will do whatever we tell them to do. You know, the, it's, it's the, the, the everything, the entire setup of colonization is there at the very beginning. But that and being said, I'm going to have to wrap. Oh, there's one more question. Yeah, just real quick. Um, your previous um, uh, lectures on Africa and Portugal, this pattern had been set long before they ever got here. And, and so true. they, you know, this, this uh, lack of respect for people who are different from you is typically tribalism. I mean, all of this is, uh, you know, this is just history. The mid medieval times were incredibly brutal and yeah. incredibly hungry. People starved and it was ter terrible famine and cold. And I mean, it, I, we just are so lucky to be born in this, cent in the last century and in this century. Um, as as Americans, because uh, you know our our rights are protected, we don't have to worry about being brutalized or dragged from our beds or any number of other things. And uh, but all that stuff was very common. There was nothing nothing particularly brutal. Even even Casas, who was a very claimed to be a very peaceful man, he just documented it. He didn't he didn't say how awful they were until much later, when millions of people were dying around him. You know yeah, when he was living it, it, in when he was living in uh, in Michoacan. Yeah, it's interesting. In the case of Las Casas, I mean, we can you know he's he's part of it. He participates he in it. He's totally part of it because because all those people are potential Christians. Yeah, and but he doesn't. He, he 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 did care that they shouldn't be brought to Christianity through torture, though. Yeah, and that was that was his major uh, change against the the Spanish government and the church. Was that he didn't think torture was an appropriate way to bring people to Christianity? I, I actually think in Las Casas' case, I think he felt guilty for his participation in it. I, I do think we get that from it. Moreover, I think he was, at least initially, hoping that he could change it from the inside. I think when he originally wrote a short account of the destruction of the Indies in 1540 for Philip, he hoped that Philip would be the better king that Charles wasn't. Um, and then, of course, the book was only published publicly after he realized, after he fell out of favor with the courts, but then also after he realized Philip wasn't going to change things. So the, the, the path was set, that there was no changing or moving forward. Um, however, it's past 430. Thank you for being a great audience today. And hopefully um, this has been educational. Thank you again, Matt. All right. Bye-bye.
Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Matt.